Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Michael McFall. I'm the director here of the Freeman Spogli Institute. And on behalf of the U.S. Asia Security Initiative at uh, the Shorenstein Asian Pacific Research Center and Stanford's Institute of Economic Policy Research, uh, we're really pleased to have you all here today. Frankly, I'm shocked that so many people are here, Ambassador, on a beautiful day at 5 to 4. Uh, but that shows that even out here, uh, uh, there's a lot of interest in TPP and what it means for the future for our country, the region, and maybe even for California. Uh, it is my fantastic privilege that uh, we have here today my old friend and my former colleague, uh, Ambassador, do I need to call you? Okay, Ambassador Michael Froman. Um, uh, Mike, as you know, is the ambassador and runs USTR. Uh, he's been with the Obama administration from day one. Uh, we started there together at the NSC. Um, he has lots of titles that I'm not going to go through for you. He was a deputy national security advisor, assistant to the president for international economics. But what you really need to know is from day one to now, he has been involved at the highest levels with the president on every major international economic issue that the United States deals with from the trade agreements we did, or you did, uh, in the last term to TPP today. And in between, the most important thing you did, Michael, was you helped Russia get into the World Trade Organization. I don't know where that ranks in your, uh, what you think, but for me, that was a seminal moment of your career. Um, and uh, literally every single thing, G20, G8, ASEAN meetings, uh, Mike is the president's right-hand person for all of those things in Washington, but he's also the chief negotiator for all these agreements abroad, uh, going out with a bang with our, well, we'll hear what he has to say, but I think one of the most historic trade agreements that we've had, maybe one of the most important ever in TPP, which you're gonna hear about from right now, from Mike in a moment. I remember the first day I heard about TPP, we were in Singapore together at the first ever US ASEAN summit at the heads of state level. I was there to deal with the START Treaty, uh, but we were flying over and everybody kept referring to Froman's TPP thing. Uh, and they were saying it rather pejoratively, just so you know, Mike, it's like, what the hell is this? It looked really complex. It looked like there was no way we could ever get this thing done. Uh, and the aspirations seemed crazy to all of us. So we all referred to it as Froman's TPP thing. Well, now TPP is a thing a really big thing, and we're really honored that Mike took some time out of his busy schedule to come talk to us today at Stanford. So thanks for being here, Ambassador Froman. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much, Mike, and it's a privilege to be here uh, with you and Carl, and you two really represent a, a rare breed of having one foot in academia, one foot in the policy world, and, and just thank you for your service, and thank you for being such a role model for students here and uh, elsewhere around the world. Um, speaking of role models, the first minister the U.S. had to Russia um, had also been a professor before he went over there, and that was John Quincy Adams. And he too came back to an illustrious career in public service. Um, he came back around 1814 at a time when there was a great competition going on around the Eurasia region. The, the Russians called it the Tournament of Shadows. The British called it the Great Game. And this is something, of course, Carl knows a lot about as well, having been both a general and an ambassador in Afghanistan. Now, when it comes to trade, we may not be involved in anything quite as dramatic as the Great Game, but we are engaged in an important effort to promote our ideas about how the global trading system should evolve, uh, how it should take into account changes in the global economy, and how best to promote growth, development, innovation, and jobs in a way that's consistent with both our interests and our values. It's easy to take the current global trading system for granted, but in historical terms, today's openness is a relatively recent achievement and a fairly significant one at that. Since World War II, trade liberalization has added $13,000 on average to each American household's annual income and it's helped lift more than a billion people out of extreme poverty. And not many public policies can claim that kind of impact. But the system that's delivered so much up to now is bending under the strain of seismic shifts and competing approaches. 
in recent years, a series of, of forces, globalization, technological change, the rise of emerging economies have reshaped and continue to reshape the global economy. And as President Obama has said, just as the world has changed, our architecture must change as well. The Trans-Pacific Partnership, or TPP, signed earlier this month is a critical part of that architectural effort. It involves bringing 12 countries, comprising about 40% of the global economy, countries large and small, developed and developing, together to define high standard rules of the road for the next chapter in the global economy. It updates our trade policies to reflect today's economic realities. For example, it's the first trade agreement that sets out comprehensive rules to ensure a free and open internet. It's a first trade agreement to take on the issue of state-owned enterprises and make sure that when they compete against our private firms, they do so on a level playing field. It promotes innovation by having strong intellectual property rights protections, but at the same time, takes steps to ensure access to the product of that innovation. It embodies the highest labor environmental standards of any trade agreement, and those standards are fully enforceable, just like any other provision of the trade agreement. As Secretary Kerry is, likes to say, this isn't your grandfather's trade deal. And Americans will benefit from all these advances. By tearing down barriers and raising standards in other markets, we'll see an estimated $350 billion a year increase in our exports, manufactured goods, agricultural products, services, the kind of products that California excels in. And we know that businesses that export tend to grow more, pay more, hire more, and are more resilient during times of economic challenge. So by removing foreign barriers to American exports abroad, TPP will support good, well-paying jobs here in the U.S. Export-related jobs pay 18% more on average than non-export-related jobs in the same sector. So in a time when we've been concerned about wage stagnation and income inequality, increasing exports also helps increase wages. And by raising these standards abroad, we can level the playing field for our businesses and our workers and give them a fair chance at competing in all areas, but in particular, the digital economy. Uh, TPP will not only raise the income and exports for TPP members, but for the rest of the world as well. And during a time of great economic uncertainty, TPP can provide a boost to global growth. As Christine Lagarde, the managing director of the IMF has said, TPP is part of the solution for avoiding a new mediocre in the global economy. But it's not just about promoting higher growth. TPP is focused on the quality of growth. It's focused on new and emerging issues in the global economy and setting high standard rules that will bring the greatest benefits to the largest number of people, ensuring growth that's both inclusive and sustainable. So to understand how far ranging the consequences of this could be, one need only consider the alternatives. Because in today's fast changing world, the choice isn't between TPP and the status quo. It's between TPP and alternative approaches being put forward. Models that don't necessarily reflect the high standards embodied in TPP, models based more on mercantilist visions of trade and investment than the open rules-based trading system that's been so enormously beneficial. In those alternative models, the state is often absent where it should be present and present where it should be absent. Rather than promoting fair competition and combating corruption, they're rooted in excessive and unfair subsidies. Instead of recognizing the importance of labor and environmental protections, they tend to sacrifice long-term interests for short-term gains. And instead of building bridges to unlock innovation, they raise national walls to block the free flow of ideas. Consider the internet. I don't have to tell people around here how revolutionary the internet's been in terms of promoting growth, promoting innovation, promoting development. But it's also had a transformative effect on global trade by creating a modern ecosystem in which goods are traded, services are provided, and supply chains are integrated across borders, dramatically expanding and democratizing international trade. But the ecosystem that's allowed the internet to prosper thus far shouldn't be taken for granted. In the absence of rules ensuring that the internet remains open and free, there's a significant risk of states erecting multiple barriers to its operation. Barriers to cross-border data flows and data localization requirements. Tariffs on digital products, such as apps. Requirements that companies transfer proprietary technology, hand over their source code to state-owned competitors, adopt a particular technological standard or form of encryption in order to serve a market. Rules favoring one type of content over another, where websites are widely blocked and government controls content. 
These aren't hypothetical risks. They're real policies being implemented in countries around the world. And if left unchecked, these trends could effectively balkanize the internet, threatening not only the, the promising future of the digital economy, but the very architecture of the internet. This would have a, a significant effect not only on economic interests, but also on our democratic values of free speech and expression. TPP takes a stand against these policies. It's the first to trade agreement to comprehensively take on the issues of the digital economy. It promotes the free flow of data across borders and prohibits forced localization of digital infrastructure, no national clouds or regional internets. It prohibits tariffs on digital products, eliminates tariffs on information technology products, prevents forced technology transfer, and in includes a provision for combating trade secret theft, including by cyber theft. It ensures access to networks and to the services needed to conduct e-commerce. And it requires countries to create greater transparency in their regulatory process and allow input for stakeholders, for, from foreign and domestic stakeholders, to adopt consumer protections, including for privacy. So there's two different visions of how the internet and the digital economy might evolve. And TPP presents a clear choice about the future. And it's this set of rules, which we call the Digital Two Dozen, which we'll be releasing today here, uh, summarizing what TPP can do for the digital economy. The impact of this choice will be felt as acutely by startup entrepreneurs here in Silicon Valley as the entrepreneurs in Singapore. The benefits of the internet stem from its openness and the ability to connect people and move information freely. And at a time when those principles are at risk, TPP will help strengthen the coalition that defends them and in turn the integrity of the internet itself. This is a, uh, a dynamic time for the international trading system. Through TPP, we brought together this diverse group of economies at various stages of development to, set a, to define a set of high standard rules. That wasn't an accident, it was by design to demonstrate that the TPP model can work for a broad range of countries and it can serve as a template for future agreements. We've united TPP countries around high standards and that leadership is already having a magnetic effect with more and more countries coming forward saying they'd like to join TPP, including the Korea, the Philippines, Indonesia, Taiwan, and others. Now, there are a number of other regional initiatives underway. Russia has the Eurasian Economic Union. China has its One Belt, One Road initiative and the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, a 16-country trade negotiation spanning India to Japan. The EU is negotiating a free trade agreement with Mercosur. Africa is working on a continental free trade area. And there are countless bilateral negotiations going underway. And unlike the great game, this is not a zero-sum competition. All of these arrangements can coexist, but it's very much in the interest of the United States and countries with whom uh, we share interests and values that we continue to engage, take the field, and lead a race to the top. Otherwise, we're likely to find ourselves in a race to the bottom that we cannot win and should not run. So that's why TPP is so important, not just for the growth it promotes, the rules it sets, and the values it embodies, but for how it reinforces US leadership around the world. Our leadership in TPP has catalyzed progress in our negotiations with the European Union over the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. And as we've demonstrated progress in TPP and TTIP, we've caught the attention of major emerging economies, developing countries, and least developed countries who don't want to be left behind. And that, in turn, has mobilized an effort together to revitalize the broader global trading system. After 15 years of deadlock in negotiations, we've managed to achieve multilateral agreements on trade facilitation and ag agricultural export subsidies. We've reached agreements at the WTO to eliminate tariffs on over a trillion dollars of information technology products, and we're now working to do the same with environmental goods. We're making progress in liberalizing trade and services and uh, working with countries large and small, developed and developing for the first time they're now having a serious discussion about new ways to resolve historic issues and about how to introduce new issues into the multilateral trading system. I don't mean to suggest we've reached any kind of consensus about the global trade policy, but in a world of competing approaches, we've articulated a clear and compelling vision, a vision embodied by agreements like TPP and TTIP, a vision that embraces all countries developed and developing alike, and embeds them in a framework of rules that will promote economic growth and opportunity for our citizens, 
spur development around the world, and advance a set of common values that can endure long after the ink on this agreement uh, is dry. And as we demonstrate that this vision can succeed, we can build towards a new global consensus. Now, this may not be as riveting as the great game, but it's a pretty darn good one. And the long-term stakes, economic and strategic, are even higher. Thank you, and I look forward to the conversation. Well, thank you, Ambassador Froman. Mike, uh, as we got to, as we prepared for uh, his visit, we learned very quickly that he would give very brief remarks because he wanted to engage with the uh, audience. So we really appreciate that. So let's uh, let's get started right away. If it's okay with you, Mike, I'd like to ask a few questions and then uh, get uh, get with the audience. So first. Um, Mike, the, the history of TTP is a very interesting one. It goes back to 2005, and we have the uh, likes of, well, we have uh, Chile, Brunei, New Zealand, and Singapore come together in 2005 and start talking about a trade agreement. And here we are in 2016, and you're talking about an agreement with 12 countries that, as you had said, it's going to encompass 40% of the world's GDP, one-third of world's trade. How did we get here? And, and then some of the uh, decisions about who's participating right now. Republic of Korea, we have our former ambassador to the Republic of Korea, Kathy Stevens here. Um, Republic of Korea not here uh, in the agreement, Vietnam is. And um, maybe just uh, talking about the path that uh, we've walked since 2005. And is there anything in that uh, as we've walked that path that should help inform how we proceed with trade agreements in the future? Well, uh, Carl, as you said, it started with what was called the P4, uh, who together decided they wanted to do something and invited the US to participate. And uh, to be frank, there was initially a fair degree of skepticism about whether uh, this was something that we should invest a, a lot of time and energy in. But um, given what was going on in the multilateral trading system and the lack of progress there, uh, we decided that if we could uh, engage with the P4 and shape this to be a high standard platform that it was worth engaging in. And we had a very frank set of consultations with the P4 about whether they were willing to work with us on this. They decided that they were. Um, soon after that, uh, the uh, countries like Malaysia, uh, Vietnam, um, Australia also uh, joined. Um, and ultimately, uh, Canada, Mexico, and Japan joined. And of course, when they joined, it, as an economic matter, it dramatically increased uh, its uh, significance. And I think what was driving this in part is that um, uh, people wanted to be at the table helping to shape the rules of the road that was that were going forward. Issues like the digital economy or state-owned enterprises or labor and environment, we were gonna work on setting new standards in these areas and you were either inside the tent at the table working on this or you were on the outside. And so. Uh, these 12 countries decided they wanted to do that. There were a number of other countries who came later and said they also wanted to join, and we collectively agreed that it was complicated enough to uh, finish this with 12 countries, but that it would be an open platform that other countries could join if they could meet the standards, and if the 12 of us agreed, and consistent with each of our de democratic processes, in our case, you know, going to Congress for congressional approval, and uh, that's where we are now. Now what's happened is both before the negotiations were completed and certainly afterwards is that we've had a lot of interest by countries who want to be part of this. They see this as a, a, a dynamic platform to be part of. They don't want to be left out. Um, and we expect that over time it, it will likely grow. Thanks. Um, Mike, I was driving down uh, 101, Highway 101 here uh, about a month ago and turned on NPR and uh, there was an interview with Steve Inskeep and I thought that uh, you said something very interesting. You said globalization exists, but we shouldn't conflate globalization with trade agreements. Trade agreements are how we can shape globalization. What did you mean by that? Well, look, I think, uh, I think there is a, um, a vibrant and open debate about globalization and its impact. And there's no doubt that it's had an impact on all of our economies, uh, whether it's on the composition of production, wages, uh, jobs, et cetera. Um, but globalization is a, is a force. It's the product of the containerization of shipping, uh, the spread of broadband, 
the integration of economies like China and Eastern Europe that used to be closed to the rest of the world into the rest of the world. Uh, that's just a, that's a reality. Uh, if we do nothing, we are affected by globalization. If we do nothing in the United States, for example, we will compete with low-wage labor all around the world. The question is whether through trade agreements we can shape that environment. So both by disproportionately reducing barriers to other countries, the U.S. is already an open economy. Our average applied tariff is 1.4%. We don't use regulations as a disguised barrier to trade. But when we look across the Asia-Pacific region, even the TPP countries, 70% tariffs on autos into Vietnam, 50% uh, tariffs on engines, 35% tariffs on uh, chemicals, 40% tariffs on poultry. It goes on and on and on. And so we're relatively open. Other countries have more barriers. If we can lower their barriers and at the same time raise standards, so make sure that they have labor and environmental standards, since our workers and our firms do operate under labor and environmental standards, if we can raise standards abroad, then it's a more level playing field. And we are very confident that the American worker can compete and succeed in a global economy where the rules are fair and they are fully enforced. So true trade agreements, it's how we shape that. And um, uh, uh, whether it's, again, by reducing these barriers or loving the playing field by raising the standards, we are, will be better off with the trade agreement than without it. Well, going from the uh, around the world to right here in California where we sit, uh, California is got the largest economy of any of our 50 states, the largest population. And I think most people know here that if you take California's GDP and rank that globally, that not counting the United States, California would have the sixth largest GDP in the uh, world behind uh, China, Japan, Germany, the UK, and France. So as you look at California's role in our national economy, we're about 11% of American exports come from the state of California. 17% of imports in the United States come into the state of California. So goes California thinking about TPP. Uh, perhaps it has a huge influence on our national thinking about TPP. So this is a very complex, diverse economy. You started to talk, you, you talked uh, in a very interesting way about what this agreement will do in terms of the internet. California has got a lot going on in the world of services. Education is important, increasingly important to the economy of uh, California. Financial services, insurance. Uh, you've got the creative industries with uh, Hollywood uh, at over $500 billion. That's one set. And then, Mike, another important set is you were down in Monterey this morning, down around Salinas, and agriculture is important. In those two sectors, could you talk a little bit about how people living here in California should be looking at TPP? Are they winners or losers? Well, as you, as you suggest, no, no state stands to benefit more than California from TPP. You already export over $170 billion a year. Exports already support 700,000 uh, jobs in the state. And as you suggested, it's very diversified. It's manufacturing, it's agriculture, and it's services. So you benefit from really the entire agreement. I, I focused on the digital economy today because that's one uh, new and innovative area of the agreement and, and given where we are I think this is a major focus for uh, businesses in, in this area. But whether it's agriculture, as you say, um, uh, eliminating tariffs, strengthening what's called sanitary and phytosanitary standards. So this is to make sure that even as you bring down tariffs, if a, a country imposes um, a standard that's not based on science, it's really based on protectionism, it effectively keeps out our products. So we have requirements there that food safety standards be based on science, ours are, and um, dispute resolution mechanisms for making sure that if a farmer's got, got a, 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 a caseload of uh, perishables in a port someplace that can't clear customs because of a food safety concern, that we have a way of quickly uh, resolving those issues. Um, also something called geographical indications, which is the ability to sell our dairy products around the world um, at a time when other markets are, are closed to us. So it's very good for agriculture. We now are a major agricultural exporter in the United States. We, we export over $150 billion a year. And for California, whether it's uh, fruits and vegetables, uh, nuts, wine, really uh, uh, soybeans, I mean, the, the whole array of products that we make here and grow here in California uh, will find markets abroad because we know that as 
middle classes emerge, the first thing they want is more uh, nutritious products, more protein, um, uh, more safe food, and um, a grown in America, made in America product is a very good brand in that regard. On services, it's really across the board, as you suggest. It's everything from uh, the creative arts, uh, which uh, California excels in, to uh, architectural and engineering services and other professional services, being able to be an architect from here and work in other, other markets, uh, to the financial services um, sector. Uh, services employ four out of five people in this country. It's our largest part of our economy. We have a major services trade surplus with the rest of the world. We're very good, very competitive globally at trading and services, and this will open some of the fastest growing services markets in the world. Again, as these countries climb their, the, the, the ladders of development, uh, the services market in their, in their countries tends to grow disproportionately as their middle class uh, develops, as they become more urbanized. And so this is well placed for California to benefit in that regard as well. Mike, last question for opening it up to the uh, audience here. So uh, you talk about the gains that will be made for the macro economy, but there's a great concern in our country right now about wage stagnation and income inequality. It's a big political issue right now. The, pres the president, uh, I think, throughout his eight years has talked about this, and he's uh, tried to enact policies that can address this. How does TPP uh, hurt or help wage stagnation and income inequality? I think, it's a, I think that is the, the number one question. And I think, uh, as I said, right now, we compete with low wage labor around the world because we're an open economy. Uh, we know that uh, increasing exports increases wages, that our export-related jobs pay better than our non-export-related jobs. So for every billion dollars we export, it supports somewhere between five and 7,000 jobs in the US, and those jobs pay up to 18% more on average than non-export related jobs. So this is a way of uh, increasing jobs here and increasing good paying jobs. The, the Peterson Institute in, in Washington, which has probably done the most in-depth study of uh, TPP, uh, recently came out with a, a report that showed that the benefits of TPP actually disproportionately go to labor, not capital. And that's both uh, high wage and low wage labor in terms of wage gains. And so we see this as part of the way of dealing with the wage stagnation and the income inequality that, uh, that, that you rightfully flag. Thanks, Mike. Let's turn it uh, over to the audience. What I'd ask is that uh, if you'd raise your hand and uh, wait for a microphone, and if you could identify, uh, if you could identify yourself, and hopefully uh, every statement ends with a question mark. <laughs> now, let's, uh, Mark. was uh, very interesting. So I'm Mark Duggan from the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research. And I'm interested in getting a sense of uh, how the reduction in trade barriers differed across sectors. Where were the biggest reductions? And where were there somewhat smaller reductions, either because the trade barriers were already relatively low or because for whatever reason they, they remained in place. And then similarly, across the 11 countries, we all already have this well-known agreement with Canada and Mexico, for example, were the aggregate reductions for those two countries relatively small compared with the other nine, just as an example? So, um, uh, first of all, in this agreement, all manufacturing tariffs will go to zero. Every country, every line. They'll be different staging, but they will all go to zero. In the agricultural area, um, the vast majority will go to zero. Where they don't go to zero, and we have uh, export interests, we've achieved either significant reductions or quotas that will grow and give us more commercially meaningful market access uh, to the countries. From our perspective, 80% of what we import from TPP countries already comes in duty free, precisely because we have free trade agreements with half the countries already. And where we already have free trade agreements, there's no more tariffs to give away. There are other barriers that we were able to, to uh, address. For example, dairy in Canada, which was excluded from uh, from uh, uh, CFTA and from NAFTA is covered under is covered under TPP. John. John Taylor, economist here at Stanford. I was interested in um, uh, an issue you didn't address too much, I believe, and that is uh, opportunities to open our markets to poorest countries. 
ago, uh, I'm, I'm thinking of, of Carl over here over in Afghanistan, sort of why can't we ship some of our textiles? To the, so a little bit about that. It's, it's a tougher issue, but it seems very important. Well, it's a great, uh, great issue. Thank you for raising that. Uh, and in the last year, I think we've made real progress on that. So it was June of last year that Congress renewed our GSP program, Generalized Systems of Preferences program, which had expired for two years at that point. And that's the program under which most of the imports from uh, developing countries, and particularly LDCs, uh, come into the country. Uh, AGOA was also renewed in June for 10 years. AGOA is the African Growth and Opportunity Act. Uh, uh, it was 10 years is the longest extension that it's ever had. Um, and we're already engaged with a number of the African countries in thinking about what the next phase of our trade relationship is. Because a lot of them would like to move towards a more permanent, reciprocal trade relationship. And we're having that kind of uh, conversation uh, with them. One thing we, before we renewed AGOA, uh, we, did a, we studied it for about a year and looked at what had worked well, what had worked less well over the last 15 years. One thing that was interesting is that uh, it became clear that tariff preferences alone are not sufficient. We, uh, we reduced or eliminated tariffs on, I think, 6,000 lines of products coming um, out of Africa. But the, the growth in those products and their exports was still relatively modest. And it had to do with other, as you might imagine, other elements of the environment that led to their competitiveness, whether it was physical infrastructure, the difficulty of getting product from from farm to market or from factory to market, uh, or trade capacity building that needed to be done so they could take full advantage of it. So one thing we did with the renewal of AGOA is also put in place a comprehensive program to look at the whole ecosystem. So we have trade capacity programs, trade facilitation programs. We're focusing on parts of the infrastructure, particularly in the power sector, so that it's not just tariffs, but it's the rest of the, of the uh, uh, factors that will help contribute to whether Africa can take advantage of it. And Mike, can I ask a, a trade, uh, trade facilitation, trade capacity building uh, program? What would be examples of how how that would uh, be implemented? Well, in, uh, in the East African community, as an example, uh, it used to take 26 days to ship a container from the port to uh, Kigali to an import uh, to a, uh, an inland city in, in Rwanda, um, because. That truck got stopped every few miles on the road for inspections. Uh, it got to the border. It had to wait four or five days to cross the border. It got to the other side of the border, had to wait four or five days to get into the other country. That 26 days is now down to six days. By just working with the governments on both sides, going to a single customs clearance um, uh, post at the border, so it didn't have to go through it twice, computerizing the five customs organizations of the East African community so they could talk to each other and exchange information. You'd have to fill out the forms five times. Um, just nuts and bolts like that allow now that product to make it to market uh, much more quickly and much more cost competitively. What we were finding is that, that, uh, uh, the, that the same product coming out of East Africa, coffee or textiles, could not compete with the same product coming out of Central America or Latin America, because it was so much more expensive, so much more inefficient to get their product to market. So those are the kinds of things that have nothing to do with tariffs, per se, but you can eliminate tariffs, and if it takes you 26 days to get your product to the port, you're still not going to be able to sell anything to the That's a great States. example. Thanks. Mike. Uh, Mike McFall again, FSI, um, and Hoover, and Stanford uh, Political Science. Um, so I'm interested in two negotiations coming up, one in Congress and one with the Chinese. So uh, first question about America as you travel around, right? Leading candidates in both parties don't support TPP right now, at least that's what they've said. Uh, and I'm interested because you've been involved in this trade debate for a long time, going way back to the Clinton administration as well. Is this normal uh, or does this seem to you as a kind of different debate on trade, much more skepticism about TPP because there's more skepticism about trade in the United States. And if it's different, help us understand why from your perspective, right? What, what's different about it? And everybody I talk to politically says the only time, if you're lucky, you'll get this done in the lame duck. And I listen to you and it's like, it, this is, oh man, this is a no brainer that what Froman's saying here. Uh, a lot of people disagree with you and I don't know why, but I, wanna, I want your understanding of the, the nature of the debate here in the US. 
Uh, second question is about China. Uh, tell us the evolution, if you will, of their attitude towards TPP, where it is today, and where do you think it might be? Could they join? And if so, like where, how far in the future might that be? So look, I think we've had a pretty robust trade politics in this country since, uh, since NAFTA. Uh, we've had a, a, a big debate here, and it's a, a lot of legitimate issues uh, raised uh, in that debate. Um, I think that in the aftermath of uh, the global financial crisis of 2008, 2009, uh, even though we've recovered in many respects, and we've seen 14 million new jobs, we've seen unemployment cut in half, uh, we've seen uh, growth uh, every quarter, um, uh, that uh, people are still very uh, much uh, concerned about the fact there's been stagnant wages for a long time, that there is uh, increased uh, income inequality, uh, and people feel very uncertain about the international uh, economic environment and their domestic economic environment. And those are legitimate concerns. I think, again, I think the question is what do you do about it? And our answer is you need to be proactive in shaping the environment in which we compete, or others will shape it for us, and it won't necessarily be to our benefit. Um, so, I, I won't comment on presidential politics uh, per se. I will, I will uh, simply say that our approach is that we're working with members of Congress uh, to make sure that they understand what's in the agreement, how it benefits their constituents. Uh, and our sense is that those members of Congress take that, uh, that role very seriously, looking at the, the benefits, whether it's uh, their exporters or the benefits they see. I just came from Monterey. We were focusing about the, economic, uh, the environmental benefits. Um, the sort of groundbreaking disciplines around the oceans, dealing with illegal fishing, uh, fish subsidies, protection of the marine environment, protection of marine mammals, all of which are enforceable provisions in the, in the trade agreement. Um, and that working with Congress, we will get this, uh, we will get this approved. Um, I think on the second question about China, uh, first, the, the TPP isn't directed against any country. It is directed towards setting high standards for the global economy. And that's why these 12 countries came together and they, they have very diverse countries that have all agreed that these are the standards that, that, that should apply. Uh, China's got its own regional arrangements, its own bilateral arrangements uh, it's working on. Uh, it's very proactive in the, uh, uh, in the region in terms of trying to uh, launch efforts to integrate um, uh, the region. And as I said, those can all coexist. We just think that it's appropriate to set high standards and to start this race to the top rather than be subject to uh, a race to the bottom. When it comes to TPP specifically, we've kept the Chinese very much informed and updated about the negotiations. Uh, we have a very good dialogue uh, with them about it. And when they've raised questions about whether you know, they could ever join, um, the, we've, we've channeled that question into the negotiation of a bilateral investment treaty with them. Because that's a, effectively equivalent to the investment chapter of TPP, it will require very significant reforms on China's part in terms of the role of the government in managing uh, their economy. We've been making actually quite good progress over the last two years uh, on it, but we still have a ways to go before it reaches the standard that would be acceptable. And uh, we've had a very good dialogue with them about that. The, uh, the, Mike, the president had said that if um, we don't have TPP, then China writes the rules. Uh, if you were talking to the Chinese leadership and said, well, you can, we'd welcome you to come into TPP, would, you're, would you also be saying if they come in, they get to help shape the rules? Well, the, the idea behind TPP is that it is a platform that others can join, but the rules are now set. Mm -hmm. We're not going to reopen and renegotiate uh, the rules. We're certainly not going to weaken the rules to include other countries. We'll have to negotiate market access commitments with each country as they join, but uh, though there is now a extant set of rules that they will, that they or anybody else would have to um, uh, get comfortable with that they could meet, and we would have to get comfortable. We, the twelve, would have to get comfortable that we were confident that they were able and willing uh, to meet those high standards. And in our case, of course, if each country is different. In our case, uh, we would uh, want to consult with and ultimately get approval by Congress for doing that. Thanks, Anya. Hi, Anya Manuel, former U.S. State Department, now here at Stanford and with Rice Hadley Gates. 
thank you for your presentation. That was great. I have one quick follow-up from Mike's question about China and then one about California politics. So uh, on China, <coughs> completely understand you've kept the Chinese informed and you're negotiating a bit with them. I was struck especially by the internet freedom provisions of the TPP, which I think are great. They really help our tech companies. But don't those in particular make it extra difficult to China for China to ever join? And are you talking to them about those specifically? That's question one. And question two is, this is a big benefit for California if it's ever implemented. Are you getting help from Governor Brown or any of the other Democratic governors in getting it passed? Well, I think on, on, uh, on China and the internet, completely separate from TPP, we have a, a ongoing conversation with them about uh, uh, free flow of information, about uh, the internet, about the cyber environment. Um, so there are certainly issues that uh, uh, we need to engage with them on, completely separate from TPP. But there, you know, again, that's a, a good issue to bring up because our goal is not to have as many countries as possible in TPP. It's to have a high standard agreement and see how many countries can meet that standard. And so we're not, we don't want to grow TPP for the sake of growing it. Um, we, and certainly not by lowering standards. We are working with the, our, our fellow partners uh, to identify what we think the appropriate standards are for the new global economy, and then we'll see which countries are able to, uh, are able to meet them. In terms of California, um, I think we have a lot of work to do with the um, congressional delegation uh, here to help underscore what the benefits of the agreement uh, are. Uh, we are talking to governors and mayors um, all over the country. Uh, we have a, a bipartisan group um, of mayors and governors who are supportive, and I think that's helpful because you know mayors and, and, and governors tend to be close to the ground. They sort of see what it takes to create jobs or attract economic activity to their, uh, to their area, and that can help create the environment in which uh, this gets support as well. Yeah, please. Hi, Kathy Stevens from FSI's uh, Asia Pacific uh, Research uh, Center. Uh, it probably won't surprise you to hear that, that, that some of the discussion of TPPs is sort of deja vu all over again when I think about uh, your work uh, uh, during the first term of the Obama administration and finalizing and ratifying and implementing the uh, Korea-U.S. free trade agreement at that time, and I guess still the largest free trade agreement for the U.S. since NAFTA. Um, many of the arguments that we heard at, at that time, both the benefits of the agreement uh, and the concerns about it are ones that I hear echoed in, in the discussion about TPP. And I, I wonder what your assessment is of, of how chorus US, uh, uh, how the U.S.-Korea free trade agreement has gone. Um, was it oversold? Uh, is, it, is it something that can be pointed to as an example, as a template, if you like, uh, for what TPP will do? That's a good question. I, I think it, uh, it is still a work in progress. It's still being implemented. Uh, as you know, the number of the provisions had many years to, uh, to implement. I think um, we were affected by the fact that Korea went into an economic downturn just as, as, uh, as Chorus was implemented. So some of the initial statistics uh, didn't look that great, but we've seen increasing sales, for example, of cars made in the U.S. by 300 percent, albeit from a small base, but 300 percent over four years is not a bad start. Um, and we're continuing to see that kind of of growth. I think um, in terms of implementation, um, it was uh, certain issues took longer than they should have to get resolved, but they ultimately all did get resolved. And we're working closely with the government of Korea to make sure that as issues pop up around implementation, concerns about it, that they address them uh, uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, hey, do you want to wait for the uh, microphone, please? Okay. Thanks. Jun Lok Choi, LFSI Assurance in A Park. So I think a lot of us have been working under the assumption that we will figure out how to get this passed in the domestic politics of the presidential election. Um, I wanted to kind of like hear your thoughts about the ramifications of a potential failure to get the agreement passed. For instance, I think there's a lot of concern amongst Asian allies that if the U.S. Uh, fails to get this ratified, then the U.S. will no longer be taken seriously. And I was wondering if you could say a few words about this possibility. Oh, yeah, I, think, I, think that's, uh, I think that's a good way of, first of all, I don't really consider failure to be an option, um, uh, for the record. Uh, uh, <laughs> we're going to get it done. 
but I think your, your point is a very good one. And you know, it really goes back to some of, the, uh, uh, some of the China discussion. Every country in the region, including ourselves, uh, needs to have a positive, constructive relationship with China. China has been uh, the dominant party in that region for centuries. It will be the natural dominant party uh, going forward. Um, so this isn't an issue of one or the other. But the question is whether this region is defined going forward purely as China-centric or as trans-Pacific in nature. And in that regard, I think a lot of our Asian partners are looking to make sure that the rebalancing strategy towards Asia that the, that the president uh, launched is real, and that the U.S., which has always been a Pacific power, has an enduring commitment to these countries and to doing what's necessary to engage. And TPP is perhaps the most concrete manifestation of the rebalance. And so I, I think your point is a good one, that failure by Congress to pass uh, TPP would raise questions in the minds of our allies of whether we had uh, the wherewithal to play the role in Asia that we seek to play and that they seek for us to play. They very much want us to be involved in their lives, involved with them. And they see TPP both as an economic uh, a mechanism uh, for promoting growth and trade and integration, but also as a strategic uh, issue and as a way of binding the US to this region uh, going forward. And they will be looking very carefully to see whether or not uh, we deliver on our promise of uh, committing to this region. Mike, so the Congress can act upon it before the election, unlikely. Um, could do it during the lame duck session, maybe. What if they do neither and uh, we punt and it's the next Congress that has to uh, take this up? How difficult in your mind will, this ma will it make it then? Well, there are lots of ifs, there are lots of ifs in that question. There are lots of uh, embedded assumptions. Look, our focus right now is getting it done and getting it done as early as possible. And that's why we're just gonna keep on working member by member, group by group in Congress, uh, making sure they understand what's in it, address their issues, address their concerns if they have them, um, and lay the foundation for that when there is a window that they'll take it up. I think uh, we're, we're consulting very closely with congressional leadership and I think it's too early to predict exactly when it might be brought up. And so all we can do is keep on working step by step to have it ready so that whenever uh, the window does open up that it's ready to go. Thanks. Larry. Hello, I'm Larry Diamond at FSI in Hoover. I have a question very narrowly about whether Taiwan would have to wait as a practical matter in your view for implicit or explicit Chinese approval or co-entry, um, <clears throat> or whether it really will be uh, judged in its bid for membership, which you know is going to come on the economic merits. But I also have a suggestion, if I can offer it. <clears throat> You're not going to like it, and I don't think you'll do it, but I'm actually serious in suggesting it. I think you should offer to debate Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders, <laughs> because the well of potential public support for this is being poisoned by populism of the left and right. And there really is not eloquent, forceful, reasoned, and fact-based pushback. And I think you may be underestimating how much damage this is doing to, you know, as these juggernauts roll down the line to, uh, uh, to the prospects for approval. Uh, and, you know, we have a presidential candidate, I'm not going to name her, who we presume believes in this, but is now backing away from it because of this political momentum that's gathering. And, and who's pushing back against it? I'll answer your first question. <laughs> uh, look, with regard to Taiwan, uh, uh, they are a member of uh, APEC. They have expressed interest uh, potentially in uh, joining TPP, and at this point, our focus is really on the 12 of us getting it ratified in our respective domestic processes. We have not yet turned to the issue of who and how and under what conditions uh, future uh, members might uh, accede to the agreement. Um, uh, but, uh, but they have expressed interest in it, and 
um, uh, and uh, we'll have to address that at some point. And Larry, with regard to the second question, failure is not an option. <laughs> <laughs> Please. Hi, my name is Paul. I own a small business here in uh, Silicon Val Valley. My question has to do with these tribunals that will be decide or arbitrating any issues between, say, corporations and some of the host nations. And um, my concern is that these uh, tribunals are really outside of the jurisdiction of the U.S. courts, and they're like, if I'm if I'm correct, they're made up. Of member nations the, uh, that belong to the TPP. And, but my question is, is this a good idea for something where the U.S. taxpayers could be on the hook and it's being decided by some tribunal that's outside of the U.S. courts? And to me, I'm questioning the wisdom of that. Is that a good idea? Well, thank you. Thank you for asking the question. Uh, what he's referring to is the investor state dispute settlement procedures, which, um, as he said, is a mechanism by which investors, so businesses who have invested in another country, if they feel as though their property has been expropriated, for example, can bring a claim in a neutral international arbitration against the government. And it really goes back to the issue of whether a, uh, a, a company suing a foreign government is likely to get a fair shake in a foreign court. We have for a long time, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you the statistics here in a second, we have for a long time felt that it was important that Americans doing business abroad have some semblance of protection similar to the protection we give every American and every foreigner in the United States under the Constitution, under the Takings Clause of the Fifth Amendment, so that the government can expropriate your property, but if they do so, they have to pay prompt, adequate, uh, fair compensation. And that's really what this is about. And there's a long history of these neutral tribunals of arbitrating claims between companies. Actually, it goes back to the Jay Treaty after the Revolutionary War in terms of companies settling claims against governments. It was thought not to put that in courts, but to have claims tribunals uh, to, to address issues like that. There are 3,200 agreements around the world that include ISDS. This is not something new. It's not something the TPP invented. It's been around for 50 years. 3,200 agreements. The US is party to 51 of them. We've had 51 agreements over the course of 30 years. Over the course of 30 years, 51 agreements, we've had a total of 17 cases brought against us. 13 cases to conclusion, and the government has never lost a case. And that's because our government regulates consistent with the Constitution. Because if you want to challenge something that the government does, you are likely to go to a U.S. court where you can get not just compensation, you can get a rule overturned, you can get a law invalidated as unconstitutional, you can get it stayed by a court. You can't do any of that in the ISDS. ISDS only applies to the very limited obligations in the investment chapter of an agreement, and you can only get compensation. You can't overrule a regulation. You can't overrule a, uh, a law through ISDS. So we have worked over the course of, of our several agreements and TPP takes it further than anywhere, any time before, to tighten the standards, raise the standards, close loopholes, add safeguards to make it very difficult to prevail in an ISDS claim except when it, what it's designed for, which is in a case of, for example, expropriation. And as a result, over the years, we've never lost, we've never lost a case. Uh, that's not necessarily the case around the world. Other countries have different standards in their agreements. One of the benefits of, of TPP Let's, let's say TPP doesn't go forward. Then the 3,200 agreements exist with a varying degrees of standards. If TPP goes forward, we set a new high standard for ISDS, which makes it even more clear that governments can regulate in the public interest, that you can't sue because of lost profits, you can't sue because of an expectation that regulations will remain the same. These are all the kinds of reforms we have in TPP that haven't existed in these other agreements. So we see TPP, we, we agree with some of the concerns that have been raised historically around ISDS. We see TPP as addressing them. How are arbitrators selected and who are they accountable to? So uh, the, as is sort of traditionally the case in arbitration, one party picks one, one party picks another. 
and the arbitrators pick a third, or if they can't choose, if they can't decide, it goes to, for example, a, a, an entity of the World Bank called ICSID that picks the, the third. Um, and that's the way it has tended to be. They tend to be uh, people who have expertise in international, uh, in international law. You know, one of the concerns that have been raised are, you know, uh, if you're an arbitrator one day and an advocate the next day, the conflict of interest concerns, we've dealt with that in TPP too. TPP for the first time has a code of ethics around the arbitrators to address that issue as well. So we, we've tried to listen to the concerns. We actually share a number of them. But one should actually look at the agreement. It's on, it's on the web, by the way. The whole TPP, it's on the web. We've tried to make it easier to navigate by having a chapter summary for every chapter. We have fact sheets on every major issue, including ISDS, that go through all the reforms that are included in there. Um, I think we've tried to address those concerns uh, quite, quite aggressively. Thank you. Don. Don Emerson, A. Park. I have two questions, a narrow one and a broader one. The narrow question is this. From the beginning of the TPP, it was identified as a gold standard, you know, high quality, okay? But if one looks at the annexes, some of them are really thick. And some participants are, you know, their reservations, their caveats, uh, they're opting out. Uh, I wonder to what extent that reduces the gold maybe to copper. <laughs> I mean, I'm just asking how much you can get away with in an annex while still preserving the high quality standard. I think it's a good question. I mean, what, we, what we've tried to do is, in the, the agreement itself, the body of the agreement itself, set very strong obligations, because those are the obligations that any future country would have to sign on to. And then they'd have to negotiate their annexes, their, their exceptions. But we also try to be sensitive to each country's particular political sensitivities. Um, and some countries had more than others. We all have them, by the way. Uh, but some have, some, have, uh, some, have more, uh, some have more than others. Wherever possible, we tried to make the exceptions be more around transition periods. So countries would agree to the high standard, but we would give them two years or five years to, to get there. Uh, where they couldn't live with that, and we had to, to, to narrow the obligation somewhat, we tried to narrow it down as much as possible. And, um, I can only tell you that over the course of the negotiations, what you see at the end is a much narrower version than what, where, countries, uh, where countries started from. But I'll, I'll give you an example. I mean, uh, an issue that is of particular political sensitivity in Malaysia is their Bumiputra policies. You know, these are their policies that uh, provide um, uh, effectively preferences for their majority Malay population. There is no way that Malaysia could agree to a trade agreement that got rid of their Bumiputra policies. And we committed early on to try to get to the highest standard agreement without forcing them to get rid of something that is so central to their history, their culture, their social unity. And that was part of the sensitivity that we tried to show there. Don, I wonder in the interest of just trying to uh, get the uh, microphone around to as many people, if we could move on then, Th please. Claude Ezron from uh, Palo Alto. Uh, you explained the benefits of a TPP for the United States uh, very well. One of the arguments you use is that uh, there was a very lopsided uh, situation with very high tariffs in some countries and very low in the US. But that, turns, that begs the question, uh, why would uh, the other countries, uh, I'll take Vietnam as an example, but have very high tariff and who are selling very comfortably in the US, uh, a lot of goods. And, uh, why did they accept uh, to join the TPP? What's in it for, for them that we should know? Look, I think uh, look, Vietnam's a, a, a great example because there's no country in TPP that will have to undergo more steps to bring themselves into compliance than uh, Vietnam. And at every step, before, before Vietnam joined TPP, we went through an extensive consultation with them where we said, here are the kinds of things we're gonna be asking you to do. Are you sure that this makes sense for you? you know, we're gonna be asking you to reform your labor market. We're gonna be asking you to reform your state-owned enterprise sector. We're gonna be asking you to raise your intellectual property rights standards. Uh, we're gonna be asking you to have environmental policy. And they would go back and have their internal political process and come back and say, yes, this is the direction we wanna take our country. TPP will help get us there. And so 
for some countries, they're looking at TPP as a way of helping to support domestic reforms that they want to undergo anyway. And this will give them the discipline and the structure uh, to, uh, uh, to do that. And one only need to look at the, 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 in the labor chapter, we have something called the consistency plan for Vietnam, where Vietnam has agreed. Here's a communist country, one party state, one labor union labor market, that has agreed to allow independent unions that can elect their own leaders, control their own finances, conduct strikes, uh, get assistance from other organizations, whether it's the AFL-CIO or the ILO, affiliate as they wish. That's really quite a substantial step forward. And, uh, but they see that this is a way of helping to stabilize their labor market where they have currently wildcat strikes and they wanna make sure that their environment is one where they're able to attract investment uh, where uh, business activity is done on a stable basis. Um, please. Um, Yang Li at FSI, economist at FSI. I wanted to um, ask you about inequality a bit more further. Um, so you mentioned that there's going to be gain because there's exporter will ha they have higher wages um, in general, but um, it's the nature of trade that there will be losers in, in, in certain sectors. Certain firms will have to import. Certain industries will be importing more. And um, in trade policy, Thai tries to help those by providing training to move into different sectors. Um, do you think that's still the best policies given um, the overall agreement of TPP, how large the scale is? Or do you have other recommendations in mind to deal with specific trade policies to deal with inequality issues? Well, uh, we were pleased that last year as part of the trade package and trade promotion authority, Congress also passed a six-year renewal of trade adjustment assistance, which helps workers who are displaced by, uh, uh, by international trade. But obviously we think there's a lot more that could be done, whether it's through education or investment in infrastructure or entrepreneurship and other things to make it more clear for everybody, not just for people affected by trade, to see themselves towards better jobs, higher wages, uh, and, and the like, including you know, minimum wage uh, laws and things of that sort. So we think there's much more to be done domestically, um, uh, uh, more broadly separate from, uh, separate from uh, TPP. I think what's interesting in terms of the, the uh, the, the winners and losers argument is we, we really have very little protection uh, left in the United States. And as I mentioned, 80 percent of the products coming in from TPP are already duty free. And so if you look at the areas where we have peak tariffs, uh, textiles, shoes, or other forms of protection, sugar, dairy, trucks, that's kind of it. Uh, Textiles, we were able to come up with a position that our domestic textile producers support and our apparel importers. Shoes, we were able to come up with a position that our shoe importers support and that our um, uh, domestic producers are, uh, are okay with. Um, uh, sugar, we managed to do very uh, modest market access. Dairy, we struck a balance between our export interests and our import interests so that they feel as though overall um, the package uh, was uh, uh, less concerned that they expected it to be. Um, and trucks, the, the, the tariffs on imported trucks from Japan won't be eliminated until 30 years after the agreement goes into a force. So we try to take those areas. If you can use existing protectionist programs or um, uh, tariff peaks as a proxy for sensitivities. We looked at the areas of sensitivity and tried to find solutions that would work uh, for those domestic industries as well. Mike, we've got about 10 more minutes. Um, one topic that's not come up uh, is currency manipulation. And uh, TPP refers to it, and yet you've got uh, one of the big winners listed in TPP is the uh, automotive industry, but you've got a Ford uh, Motor Vice President for International Relations, which has said that TPP does not do enough for currency manipulation. So the agreement can be a wonderful agreement on paper, but still states manipulating currency are going to be able to erode any gain that we get out of this. So this is the first agreement where 
we have an arrangement um, among the TPP parties negotiated by our treasury departments and their finance ministries or central banks um, on currency. And it does three things. It lays out criteria of what appropriate currency policy should be, drawing from the IMF, the G7, the G20. It requires enhanced transparency, which is quite significant because a number of central banks will now have to disclose when they intervene, how they intervene, how much they intervene. And then it's got an accountability mechanism where our financial authorities will get together on a regular basis and assess each other's uh, performance against those criteria. Um, uh, does it end in trade sanctions as some uh, had hoped where we would impose trade sanctions based on another country's monetary policy or, or currency policy? Uh, no, and that's something we ourselves decided we couldn't live with. We were not gonna subject our monetary policy to review by a trade tribunal and have sanctions imposed because we engaged in quantitative easing or anything of that sort. Uh, but we think this does a, takes a meaningful step forward in creating some currency discipline among the TPP uh, uh, countries. And just last week, the Senate passed the uh, customs bill, which also has some additional provisions on to give Treasury additional tools on currency so that they can continue to uh, use uh, their mechanisms to encourage uh, or discourage countries from, from engaging in currency manipulation. So it's, an is it's a serious issue. We take it seriously. We, um, uh, we did something that's never been done before in terms of a trade agreement, having, a, having an agreement among those trading partners on currency, uh, but we didn't go as far as some would have liked in terms of having trade sanctions imposed on uh, each other's monetary policies. Great, thank you. Uh, Only if there's no other questions. There's um, more in the back. Okay, fine. Uh, no, uh, Debbie, Not quite yet. right, uh, right here. Hi, JB, Christine, nobody in particular. Um, thank you so much for oh, coming to Stanford sure that's and not true. speaking so eloquently about the many benefits of TPP. Surely anything this broad, this far-reaching, that has so many benefits must also have some costs and some risks. Uh, I wonder if you wouldn't mind spending a minute or two speaking equally eloquently about what you perceive to be the known costs and some of the risks. What should we keep our eyes on when this passes? I think, uh, I think it's a very good question, nice, a nice way to put it. Uh, I, I think um, you know, there are a variety of, of um, avenues of, of criticism of this agreement. I won't go through all of them. I'd say the, the one that I, I uh, uh, let me try to answer your question this way. Um, an agreement ultimately, the, the value of an agreement ultimately depends on, in my view, not just how strong the obligations are, whether they're fully enforceable or not, but how they're implemented and whether they're enforced. And so we need to be as vigilant going forward. And people have raised questions about this. How are we gonna make sure you know, this administration, Obama administration has taken trade enforcement very seriously. We brought 20 actions in favor of the WTO. We've won all the cases that have been brought to conclusion. We brought half the cases against China and other cases against India and Argentina and the EU and uh, Indonesia and others across a wide range of, of, of significant policy, um, uh, policy problems. We wanna make sure going forward that future administrations are as committed to making sure TPP is fully implemented and fully enforced. Because a number of these issues are, are, are really gonna be quite challenging and it's gonna require building capacity in some of these countries, uh, uh, like Vietnam and others, so that, that uh, they can uh, fully implement the obligations that they've taken on, and then making sure we're holding uh, them to account if they fail to do so. And so, um, if you're saying what one thing to watch out for, I'd say watch out for how it's implemented and how it's enforced going forward. Mike. I really don't want to take the microphone if there's somebody else out there, but I can't see them. So I'm going to assume I can t ask my question. You know, Mike, we're, uh, we're, we're, out of time. The, okay. uh, we're reaching the uh, uh, end, so, okay. so you paid for that microphone. <laughs> <laughs> no, I paid for the room, not the microphone. <laughs> um, so Mike, one last question. First of all, just uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for your service. You know, when I travel around, I, I represented the United States and Russia for a while. 
and people always say, you know, only the idiots go into the U.S. government. It's really inspiring to hear somebody speak so eloquently like you. So thank you for your service. It sounds like it's going to be right to the end, uh, all eight years. Um, I left, in the interest of time, I left out a lot of things in your, your very rich biography. One thing I left out that you really need to know is that we went to school together at Oxford. That's very important. Uh, but another thing that's really important to know about your biography is you went to school with somebody else when you went to law school. That's the president. Uh, so you've known him for a long time, and you've worked with him now for, for seven plus years. And it's a bit of a par I worked for him for a while too, and it's a bit of a paradox, I think, for most Americans to think about that President Obama could go down in history as one of the, the most, uh, you know, uh, supporters of free trade in general, right? Uh, you got the three free, tr free trade agreements done before. You're doing TPP now, and you're still not done. I heard you at Munich talking about TTIP. I mean, that's a pretty big run of some really big trade agreements. And there's a, help us understand the paradox. Is it that actually President Obama has always been for free trade, and he's just not talked about it as loudly when he was running, uh, especially maybe seven years ago? Or, or has his view changed? Maybe you changed his views, I don't know. But uh, since you knew him as a graduate student back at Harvard at the law school, has his view changed? Or has this always been uh, this, this long game of getting all these things done? Has this always been part of the administration's agenda and that there was just a misperception about uh, President Obama from the beginning? You know, I... Um You've worked with him closely, so you, you've seen him work through issues and understand how his thought process works. I think uh, he's got two um, equally important lines of thought working through uh, uh, his history and his administration. Uh, one is his personal appreciation of uh, internationalism. Uh, spending time being in Hawaii, spending time in Indonesia. I think he's got an intuitive sense for uh, the international system, the importance of engagement. Uh, he gets it. Um, and the other piece, I think, comes from his experience in Chicago as a community organizer, working in communities where steel mills were closed down. You know, he went down to uh, Galesburg, Illinois, and gave a speech at Knox College about the the Maytag plant being closed down and moving to Mexico. And those two lines of thought come together in the priority he has put on doing trade right, not free trade for free trade's sake. It's doing trade but making sure the benefits are broadly shared, that uh, we're raising standards like labor and environmental standards and treating them just as seriously as any other provisions in the trade agreement, that we're getting a fair shake in terms of our access uh, to other markets, that we're fully enforcing and using all of our tools at our disposal to fully enforce the trade rights uh, that we have. Because on one hand, he understands the importance. The U.S. can't be isolationist. The U.S. can't withdraw from the, 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 the world. In fact, the U.S. needs to lead. And as you know, he's been very aggressive about showing leadership, the rebalancing strategy towards Asia. Uh, making sure that we were the ones setting the rules of the road in the region, um, not, not ceding the ground uh, to others, but making sure that we're doing so in, in a way that is consistent with our values. And that is taking into account uh, the effect on uh, the, the broad range of the American public, on American workers. You know, and that's why with a focus on wages and on, uh, on income inequality and what we can do by leveling the playing field, by opening these markets to our exports, to try and address those issues. So I see it all as quite consistent, and I think he's got, uh, uh, um, he's got equal understanding of both of these, uh, of both of these dynamics. We could, uh, we could keep this session uh, going until late in the evening, but uh, I think you have engagements up in uh, San Francisco, Ambassador. I would like to uh, recognize a couple of people very quickly who worked over a long President's Day weekend to uh, make this happen. We've got uh, Asia Pacific uh, Research Center Events uh, Coordinator Debbie Warren, have the Assistant uh, Director for the uh, U.S. Asia Security Initiative, Linda Yeomans, who is uh, ill today and couldn't be in. We've got Roger uh, Winkleman, who makes all this magnificent uh, technology in this room 
uh, usually work. And we've got Lisa Griswold, who's been uh, working well with, uh, your, uh, with your team. So uh, with that, I did want to say that Ambassador, it's really been inspirational to, uh, following up from what Mike had said, to consider how tireless your team has been working over the years now to get this agreement. What's really neat here today is now uh, the agreement uh, is uh, ready to uh, be presented to the United States Congress. And you being here today is a, really a representation of why our democracy is such a democracy to be proud of. That you here as a senior public official, you're making your case and uh, then it's up to uh, those that hear your case to take your information and all information, make their own choices, and uh, call up their congressman and tell them what they think. Thank you so much for your service you. and your team's service. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions?